1910. The place, the junction of Spokane and Little Spokane Rivers. Here an Indian was born whose life would span the unsuccessful merging of two civilizations. A person characterized as being one of the most manly, humane, and likable Indian characters known to Northwest history. Yet, a man who died in poverty and obscurity, an outcast on the land of his birth. That man was Chief Spokane Gary. Gary, whose native name has long been forgotten, was the son of Ilium Spokane, chief of the Middle Spokane Indian tribe. The Spokane Indians were divided into three main branches. The upper branch, or Muddy Creek people, occupied the territory extending along the Spokane River from the present site of Post Falls, Idaho, to the Spokane Valley. The middle branch, or Salmon Trout people, roamed the lands from the valley to beyond the junction of Spokane and Little Spokane rivers. From this location to the confluence of the Spokane and Columbia rivers lived the lower branch, or people of the Little Falls. Gary's birth nearly coincides with the building of Spokane House by the Pacific Northwest Company of Canada. The trading post is significant since it was the first permanent business establishment in the present states of Washington or Oregon. Gary spent his early boyhood in the vicinity of Spokane House and consequently had an early and friendly association with the white men. This friendly attitude was to prevail throughout his life and eventually cause him great disillusionment. At age 14, a significant event in Gary's life occurred. He was selected by the Hudson's Bay Company as one of several Indian youths in the area to be educated at Fort Garry, now Winnipeg, Canada. Some 30 Indians from across the continent were to be educated in the ways of the whites. On April 12, 1825, Garry left with the party of George Simpson, an officer in the Hudson's Bay Company, the organization which was then operating Spokane House. The journey was a difficult two-month trip down the Spokane River, up the Columbia to boat encampment, across Athabasca Pass, and down the Saskatchewan River. From Norway House, the group traveled south, the length of Lake Winnipeg, and up the Red River to Fort Garry. It was from this fort that Garry was to gain his name. Spokane was an adaptation of his father's name, Ilum Spokane. Gary, a good student, remained at the school for several years, during which time he learned both French and English and gained religious training. An Indian companion of Gary's from the Kootenai tribe died while still in Canada. Because of this, Gary returned home, the best white educated Indian in the Northwest. He had mastered the English and French languages. Determined to spread the knowledge and religious teachings he had acquired to his people, Gary set up a crude school in 1830. By doing so, he became the area's first school teacher. The basic curriculum of Gary's school consisted of English, simple agriculture, and Christian religion. Both children and adults attended the 20 by 50 foot Tulimat schoolhouse. Gary's first school was probably located near the site of Spokane House. Since Spokane House was moved to Colville before Gary returned from the Red River School, few whites traveled through the region. In 1838, the first permanent missionaries, Elkanah Walker and Cushing Eels, arrived among the Spokanes and set up a mission near Shimakin Creek, some 18 miles from the present city of Spokane. Gary continued to teach, but differences in the doctrines of varying religious viewpoints confused the Indians. This confusion led Gary to give up public teaching in 1841. In 1847, 
news reached the tribes that the Oregon country had been declared American territory. Indians viewed Americans with some hesitancy. Indian resentment flared, and a disastrous event occurred on November 29, 1847. This event will long be remembered in Northwest history, the Whitman Massacre at Waiilatpu. Here, near the present city of Walla Walla, Washington, Dr. Marcus Whitman, his wife, and 12 others were killed, and 45 persons taken as hostages. The Cayuse Indians, the main perpetrators of the killings, urged the Spokans to join them and drive the Americans from the region. Gary, from the beginning, was for peace, as he felt war would have a disastrous effect on the well-being of the Indians. The general area was closed in 1848 to any further Protestant missionary activities because of the hostile actions at Wailatpu. Elkanah Walker and Cushing Eels abandoned their Shimakan mission after a 10-year operation. Gary, nearing the age of 40, was wealthy by Indian standards, owning a number of horses and doing a considerable amount of farming. Gary's status in the tribe and the tribal standard of living were at a peak during the period marked by the absence of any appreciable number of white men in the area. In 1850, forebodings of trouble for the Indians of the Northwest arose. The donation land law was enacted that enabled any citizen to claim 320 acres of land, 640 for a married couple anywhere in the Oregon Territory, even though no treaty had been made with the Indians. This act permitted any white man to actually claim the choicest land anywhere, regardless of its use by Indians. Gary met with Isaac Stevens, governor of the newly created Washington Territory at Camp Washington, west of Spokane, in 1853, in an attempt to assure the Spokanes that their land rights would be honored. Stevens was much impressed with Gary and wrote in his journals, Beneath a quiet exterior, he shows himself to be a man of judgment, forecast, and great reliability and I could see in my interview with his band the ascendancy he possesses over them. Governor Stevens called a council in May 1855 at Walla Walla to try and persuade the Cayuse, Walla Walla, Nez Perce, and Yakima tribes to go on reservations. Gary sat in on the council but did not participate. Later, Stevens made another trip to visit the Spokanes and tried to persuade them to go on reservations. Gary made eloquent speeches stating the Indians' viewpoint. Stevens played somewhat of a dual role in the meeting, trying to convince the Indians that whites would respect the Indians' property, while at the same time trying to get them to agree to a reservation and open the land for white settlement. Gary was firm and would not negotiate. Governor Stevens told the Indians, The lands are yours. I cannot take them. I shall not take your lands from you. A strange statement made in view of the fact that the Donation Act had already been passed. Unrest among the Indians flared into open war in other areas of the territory because of annoyances over the Treaty of Walla Walla. Tension continued to mount as word reached the Spokanes of treaties not being enforced by the whites. In May 1858, War clouds loomed over the Spokane tribe's head. Word was received that Colonel Edward J. Steptoe was preparing to cross the Snake and enter the area closed to whites. Although on a mission to Colville to investigate trouble between Indians and miners, Steptoe's route was not direct and was to take him through the heart of Palouse and Spokane country. Since these tribes were basically friendly, the military did not attach any special significance to the passage. As the party progressed north of the present town of Rosalia, young braves of the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, and Palouse tribes assembled and prepared to stop any further intrusion by the military force. Gary and chiefs of the tribes involved met with Steptoe and explained Indian resentment over such a large force in their country. Gary also pleaded the cause of peace with the Indians, but to no avail. 
fighting commenced, and Steptoe was forced to retreat to a hill overlooking the present site of Rosalia. Only a daring and successful retreat at night saved the army from a possible loss of 152 enlisted men and five officers. As it was, two officers and three enlisted men were killed. Gary, having been opposed to the hostilities, did not take part in battle. The military was not to take such loss and humiliation lightly, even though up to this time they had been somewhat sympathetic with the Indian cause. Colonel George Wright departed from Fort Walla Walla in August of 1858 with 575 troops, 30 friendly Nez Perce scouts, and a large supply train. On August 31st, he camped at a spring now called Bassett Springs near Granite Lake. The following day, the Battle of Four Lakes ensued. With his howitzers and superior rifles, Colonel Wright had little trouble routing the disorganized Indians. Five to seven hundred warriors had engaged in the battles with almost an equal number of army personnel, although the present day monument suggests in error that 5,000 Indians took part. After a three day rest at Bassett Springs, Wright and his command drove the Indians across the plains. Here again, the Indians proved no match for the high-powered rifles and howitzers. Indian losses were high, while the military suffered none. This second battle was officially designated the Battle of Spokane Plains. The next day, Gary requested a conference with Wright, and the meeting took place at a ford two miles above Spokane Falls. Gary was in a paradoxical position. He had attempted to keep the Indians peaceful and was alternately cursed and praised by both sides because of his middle ground stand. Gary had not taken part in the battles, and although many Indians were angry at him for this stand, they evidently thought his reputation would be helpful in halting further bloodshed. Colonel Wright was in no mood for conciliation at this point. His reply undoubtedly sent chills up the spines of the assembled natives. His terminology was definite as he delivered this ultimatum. I have met you in two bloody battles. You've been badly whipped. You have lost several chiefs and many warriors killed or wounded. I have not lost a man or animal. I have a large force and you Spokanes, Coeur d'Alene's, Palooses and Ponderays may unite and I can defeat you as badly as before. I did not come into this country to make peace. I came here to fight. Now, when you're tired of war and you ask for peace, I will tell you what you must do. You must come to me with your arms, with your women and children and everything you have and lay them at my feet. You must put your faith in me and trust to my mercy. If you do this, I shall then dictate the terms upon which I will grant you peace. If you do not do this, War will be made on you this year and next until your nation shall be exterminated. Wright left no doubt in the Indians' minds. He concluded by telling them no lives would be taken if they did as he said. The next day, he hanged one of the Spokane chiefs. Moving eastward through the fertile Spokane River Valley, Wright took possession of 800 horses belonging to the Indians. Being unable to make use of them, he had them killed, much to the dismay and horror of the Indians. The bleaching bones of the horses were visible for over 50 years. Wright had proved his ruthlessness and would continue to do so. Storehouses similar to the one still standing near the site of Spokane House of wheat, oats, vegetables, camas, and dried berries, the Indians' winter supply were burned, a blow the Indians were to never forget. Wright continued his route, which took him around beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene, where peace terms were dictated to the Coeur d'Alene's. Before leaving the Spokane area, he again satisfied his craving for revenge by hanging seven Palouse Indians reported to have taken part in the Steptoe defeat. A council followed with Gary, once again assuming the role of leadership for the Spokane's. Unconditional surrender terms were again outlined by Wright to the assembled Indians. The activities occurring at this peaceful spot on Lataw Creek set the stage for the water's appropriate nickname, Hangman Creek. This name is still used today. 
This campsite is some 17 miles upstream from Spokane, a short distance from the towns of Waverly and Fairfield. Wright's ruthless campaign once and forever opened the Indian country of eastern Washington to white settlement and consequent decline of Indian culture in the area. The years following the battles with Steptoe and Wright found eastern Washington attracting more and more settlers. The association with the whites was to the definite disadvantage of the Indians. The military and settlers had little regard for the natives whose homeland they usurped. Competing religious denominations split the tribe into opposing viewpoints. In 1870, Gary was determined to take action that would help salvage the Spokane tribe from complete decline a tribe then numbering 716 men, women, and children. Gary's band, the largest, numbered 306. During the winter of 1870-71, Gary once again assumed the role of teacher. His second school was, as had been his first some 40 years previous, a tulemat structure attracting students of varying ages and varying numbers. The school was located within the present city limits of Spokane, near Drumheller Springs. These springs are just below a flat bench-like area on which the Indians frequently camped and was near the old trail leading north to Fort Colville. A monument has been erected a short distance west of the actual location of the school. Here, he began to teach people of his tribe to read and write. Having no paper, pencils, or slate on which to write, Gary used large cards. Pupils repeated the letters as they were shown the cards. Occasionally, the dirt floor was used as a chalkboard. In the meantime, changes were taking place by the falls of the river. Two men, Scranton and Downing, had settled by the river and built a sawmill, a mill that was the village of Spokane Falls' first business. The river, with its abundance of natural power, was beginning to attract settlers to its shores, shores that for centuries had been in the heart of the middle Spokane's territory. This was a time of change. Closer contact with increasing numbers of whites continued to bring problems to the Indians. Diseases, against which the Spokans had no resistance, appear to have been on the increase. Other problems multiplied. The tribe itself began to decline in numbers. In 1877, the Nez Perce War erupted over discontent with broken treaties and promises made by the whites. This revolt disclosed the genius of a great Indian, Chief Joseph. Fears that the Spokane Indians might enter the war heightened when a few of the Nez Perce appeared near Spokane Falls. Nightly war dances caused the settlers from the surrounding villages to gather on Havermail Island in the Spokane River for safety. The Spokanes, perhaps remembering the bitter defeat at George Wright's hands, refused to become involved. Gary was promised that if his people remained at peace, they would be well provided for. Unfortunately, this was another promise never fulfilled. Years passed, and promises for an adequate reservation never became a reality. The lower Spokanes under Chief Lot did accept a small territory near the mouth of the Spokane River. The reservation took care of but a fraction of the tribe, and was on land generally unwanted by the whites. In the meantime, Gary lived on and farmed an excellent piece of land near the northeast corner of present-day Spokane in the Hilliard area. Gary put a fence around his farm and made improvements. Under agreement, such homesteads were supposedly assured to Indians, especially if they became citizens, which Gary attempted to do, become a citizen in his homeland and the homeland of his ancestors. Gary, his land being in crop but not ready to harvest, joined other Indians at a temporary fishing camp on the Spokane. Fish were still important to the tribe's subsistence. This was a fateful day for Gary. Word reached him that his homestead had been taken over. Hurrying back home, he was ordered to get off and stay off by white men. His land had been claimed by legal maneuvers. Gary lost his home and land forever, and his disillusionment deepened. The Spokanes agreed to give up all land outside established reservations in 1877. Gary and four other old chiefs were to receive $100 each per year. 
Having lost in his effort to regain title to his farm, Gary once more returned to his teepee. Gary and six or eight other Indian families camped along Hangman Creek. Unfortunately, most people in nearby Spokane Falls had little regard for Indians. One by one, Gary's horses were stolen by miners and settlers. After all, as some whites said, what rights had a dirty savage? Finally, to avoid continued harassment by the whites, Gary, his wife and daughter, and the other families moved camp to an area near Indian Canyon. Gavin Mowat gave the Indians permission to pitch their tents on his land. He later said he was much impressed with the Indians' respect for property and great honesty. In nearby Spokane Falls, continued changes were occurring. Several years had passed since the railroad had reached the city. A great fire had destroyed most of the business section in 1889. New buildings were more imposing than the earlier structures. Electricity was no longer an oddity. Now homes, streets, and stores were lighted by glowing electric lights. Electric railways carried passengers about the city. Fashionable homes were being built on land once occupied by teepees. By 1891, Spokane was a thriving city of 26,000. The Spokesman Review of January 1st, 1891, listed 1,000 new homes built and ran 20 columns listing new buildings. Seven electric railways within the city were operating. The imposing new South Central High School had been constructed along with several elementary schools. Two transcontinental railroads ran through the city and five bridges spanned the Spokane River. Yet, in this land of prosperity, Gary and his band were considered squatters. Squatters on the land of their birth. On January 12, 1892, life ended for Gary. His search for peace had at last been fulfilled. As has been the case in many instances, most of the kind words came after death. The Spokesman Review stated at the time, Gary was a man whose friendship for the whites over half a century made the settlement and development of a large part of the Inland Empire a comparatively easy task. Ironically, Gary had never received a cent of his promised annuity. The year 1892. The place, Indian Canyon. Here in a tent, on a cold and wintry night, life ended for Spokane Gary. Indian chief, teacher, farmer, statesman, and preacher.